Well, I'm here today with Clarence Lamb, who is a physician here at Johns Hopkins um, School of Medicine and the director of the General Preventive Medicine Resi Residency. And he is here today talking with us in his role as delegate for uh, District 12. Just to check Sorry. in. District 12 and the Maryland General Assembly. Uh, so Clarence, tell me about your work on the issues of addiction treatment and drug policy and how did you first get involved in these issues? So I first got involved in these issues because of the dual hats that I wear. Mm -hmm. um, as a legislator, you know, I think our job is to help serve the community, particularly in areas where uh, and, and for constituents that don't particularly have that voice. Mm -hmm. um, but as a physician, I think it's incredibly important to look at um, uh, addiction and drug abuse as a medical condition. And I bring that hat because uh, I believe we can treat it, and we mm -hmm. do need to treat it. And there's a lot of, that we can do to help promote policies that will help people. And I think for too long, we've looked at policies that really look at addiction and drug abuse from the opposite lens, that of uh, law enforcement, and that it is a behavioral choice. And I think that's the wrong way to look at things. And, and if we can change that paradigm and look at the uh, issues and concerns with drug addiction and uh, drug abuse from the perspective of the um, of a physician and from the perspective of the fact that it's a chronic disease, mm -hmm. that there's a lot more that we can do to help um, bring people back from that and uh, reintegrate them into society in ways that can be productive rather than taking them away from society in ways that are counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned your, your work as clinicians. So can you tell me about um, your experience with the problems of addiction and drug-related violence through that work and how you've experienced seeing people coming into the hospital or coming into your practice. Mm -hmm. So when I saw patients in, in Baltimore and the surrounding area, um, you know, I think I saw a lot of cases that really stem from drug abuse and addiction um, that were masked in many ways, that we might have mm -hmm. folks come in with a laceration to the arm and uh, you know that's how they would present, but the underlying cause of that might have been the fact that they were breaking into a vehicle because they had to um, uh, fund their uh, daily addiction, mm -hmm. and uh, that didn't manifest itself as an addiction when you look at the chart and you're looking at the medical record saying, person here for uh, drug abuse or addiction, it manifests itself, manifests itself in different ways. But it's all too important for us as clinicians to be able to recognize those signs um, and be an advocate for uh, patients like this because that's what they really need, that this is not a law enforcement um, enforceable problem that can be solved through uh, those types of policies, but rather uh, this is a problem of um, a medical condition that can be treated, that can be addressed, and we as clinicians need to be able to step up and help uh, address those concerns. And so I'm coming at it from the perspective of, of a physician who's seen these types of cases um, in the emergency room, in our local hospitals, and it's incredibly important for us to recognize these cases as medical conditions so that we can address them with proper treatment modalities. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned it in terms of being a, a clinical issue and being a, 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 a disease that happens over the long term. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Maryland's uh, work on the all-payer system and the integrated um, medical record have and the kind of transportable um, personal health record mm -hmm. is going to help in combating issues like drug addiction, because as you see, as you say, people are presenting with you know, with lacerations, with you know, alternative injuries right. that are fueled by drug abuse, but may or may not actually be the core problem. Right, You're right. I think there are uh, policies that have been put into play that do help. Um, address this, but I think there's a lot more that we can do as well. You know, the policies that you mentioned, having an all-payer uh, waiver system um, where uh, the costs of that are distributed amongst uh, the health institutions and not bore out by, um, borne out by certain institutions in particular, um, and electronic medical records, and also the new prescription drug um, monitoring program here in Maryland that's been stood up. But, you know, I think that is um, uh, only getting at parts of the problem. Those are parts of the problem that uh, address addiction once it's already um, manifests itself. And I think there's a lot more that we can do to um, help prevent addiction from um, being as uh, prominent in our society as it is, um, to make sure that people get help early, to make sure that mm -hmm. there are social services and, and support networks that are there for patients uh, before they reach that 
um, degree of uh, severity that we see them ending up in the hospital or that we see them ending up in a clinic and we notice this because they're going through multiple uh, providers and we notice mm -hmm. that on the prescription drug monitoring program. There's a lot more that we can do beforehand and I think that's what we need to focus on as policymakers and that's why this conference has been so um, uh, you know, enriching for us as policymakers because it helps get to that root of the problem and how we can address this better as a society. Sure. And, and on that subject, and moving on to our next question, do you see, I guess I should say, what specific results do you see coming out of the harm reduction conference in terms of policies that could help reduce or prevent drug addiction and drug related violence in Maryland? Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of policies that could, could potentially come out. I'm looking forward to uh, the small group sessions that we're going to be having mm -hmm. later this afternoon. Um, and, you know, some of the things that have already been touched on are also bills that, that we've recognized in the, in the General Assembly that we're going to try to continue to promote. Um, but it's conferences like this that bring in stakeholders together, bring in the advocacy mm -hmm. community, bring in new thoughts and new ideas that can really help stimulate and generate uh, momentum and support for bills. Mm -hmm. So in the last legislative session, for example, I had a bill that I had uh, introduced that will um, enable all counties in the state of Maryland to uh, begin a needle exchange program or a syringe exchange program if they so choose. Mm -hmm. um, this was simply enabling language. It was not a requirement for local counties to be able to, uh, or a requirement for them to have to stand up a syringe exchange program. Um, Baltimore City, as many folks are aware, for the last 20 years or more, has had a needle exchange program, but other jurisdictions, except for Baltimore City and Prince George's County in Maryland, have not had that ability or authority to do so, and this would be a, a bill that would be able to enable them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a good first step, and, and there's still policies that we can um, institute and, and look at that uh, can continue to help uh, people in making sure that we prevent uh, these types of conditions um, and also uh, address it as a medical concern rather than from a strictly law enforcement mass incarceration type yeah. of uh, model. You know, and you mentioned the, the needle exchange program in particular. You know, that really brings out the, the controversial nature of these sorts of issues, specifically mm -hmm. with addiction and drug policy. Uh, what do you think needs to be done in order to make meaningful progress in these areas in Maryland? So I think, you know, a few things can be done. Um, one, um, you know, conferences like this really help stakeholders come together and come up with new ideas and ways that we can progress, uh, make progress on issues that otherwise would not be able to uh, uh, see the type of progress that we're seeing now. Um, two, you know, I think as, as community leaders, um, and all of us are community leaders in our own right, mm -hmm. um, have a uh, really need to step up and, um, you know, frame this in a way that this is a medical condition that can be treated, mm -hmm. that these are human beings, that these are people, um, and, you know, they're suffering from a medical condition that's an addiction. Um, and the community leaders also need to step up and help um, convey the fact that drug addiction, harm reduction is a very politicized issue mm -hmm. and we need everyone to step back from the politics of it and the stigma that comes with it as well to look at it as a medical condition for people mm -hmm. who need help and I think when you reframe the argument um, in that way it makes the community uh, better understand why these programs are necessary makes it easier for them to recognize the need for this mm -hmm. and makes it um, more palatable for them to um, support programs like this that really are not looking to harm people but are really looking to support people in getting them the help that they really need. Absolutely. One last question then we'll break. Um, you, you, again, we come back to treating addiction and you know, drug policy issues as, as public health and, mm -hmm. and medical issues. And I want to bring back in your work with the General Preventative Medicine Residency here at Hopkins. How do you feel like that connects back to harm reduction and connects back to producing meaningful change in policy around drug issues? Mm -hmm. So that's a very good question. So I, I serve as a program director of the uh, General Preventive Medicine Residency Program here at Hopkins where we train about 15 to 20 physicians each year in our specialty of preventive medicine. I think that's important because, um, you know, clinicians and physicians are a part of this discussion as well. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of physicians, uh, the concepts of harm reduction um, are foreign. And uh, a lot of them may not have to face um, on the surface of it uh, the 
um, outcomes or the effects of uh, drug addiction mm -hmm. and dependence in our communities. Um, oftentimes, as we've talked about earlier, they're masked by other conditions or other symptoms that patients present with. Um, and so training physicians who understand harm reduction, who understand the importance of getting folks treatment that they really need and, and framing, being able to frame that paradigm of addiction as a chronic medical condition is incredibly important because not all physicians have that perspective. And so training physicians like uh, preventive medicine doctors that we see here at Hopkins and being able to be that spokesperson, be those advocates in the community are incredibly important. And our, our uh, preventive medicine residents are doing incredible work in the community as well. We've had one who um, really spearheaded the effort for the Baltimore City Health Department, mm -hmm. their overdose prevention initiative. Um, he's trained probably dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, individuals in how to use naloxone um, as a drug for opioid reversal mm -hmm. um, to prevent uh, unnecessary deaths. And so, you know, our preventive medicine residents are really at the forefront of uh, spearheading efforts in harm reduction, in reducing drug and alcohol dependence. And, uh, you know, we look forward to continuing to be able to train future physicians in these incredibly important um, issues. Jolly, thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure.